Okay, let's see if we can get this rolling here. Hello, Randy. I can see your see your name there. All right, then we are going to get started, Randy and Dr. Sievers, if you are ready, and well, then people will be able to continue to join in via the, the audience, Zoom, as they see fit. All right, well, welcome, everyone. Hello, I'm Dan Powers. I'm the executive director of CoLabs, a consortium of federally funded research agencies and joint institutes on research university campuses in Colorado. And I wanna welcome you to, this is the kickoff inaugural session of our webinar series of the ROI on research, where we are revisiting with prior year's winners of the governor's awards for high impact research to hear how their discoveries and the science that they were recognized for several years ago has continued to manifest and impact further research, further discoveries, and become part of the latest in cutting edge science and research that's happening here in Colorado. Today, we are welcoming Dr. Bob Sievers, who was recognized in 2009. And I'd like to give a little bit of background on what that award was about. And then we will segue into hearing from Dr. Sievers and his team what has become of that research and really the latest type of research they're involved in today. A little bit of a background though, and I'm going to move ahead here. Should be able to share my, uh, excuse me, move my slides ahead. Whoop. Getting a little too ahead of myself with Governor Polis on the screen there. So as you can see, in 2009, Dr. Sievers was an awardee for the science and research regarding inhaled aerosol vaccines. Let me give the audience just a quick background on what this research was about. He was recognized, of course, as a team leader. And when I've spoken with him, he said, be sure to know that this was not just me. There are numerous people who are involved in the facets of this research. Uh, however, he is really the point person who Governor Bill Ritter at the time chose to make a, a spotlight about and give this award to. Building from their development of methods to create dry inhalable vaccines and pharmaceuticals, scientists at CERES, the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Science at CU Boulder, at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, also with labs in Boulder, and the University of Colorado, we're playing a leading role in an international collaboration to provide a dry powder, live, inhalable measles vaccine with inexpensive single dose inhalers. The vaccine had the advantage of easel, easy needle free administration, low shipping costs, and no need for refrigeration. This was in 2009. Working with private sector companies and the World Health Organization, this technology then was sent out into the field to be tested and okay. administered okay. throughout several developing companies or countries. Um, the demand for that was expected to be and has become several hundred million doses per year, saving many, many thousands of lives. And the inhalable tuber tuberculosis antibiotics are also being researched. Now, this was back, as I described, in 2009. We're going to hear today what has become of some of that research and also the latest research that Dr. Sievers and his team are involved in. If I could, let me jump ahead here. A comment from Governor Jared Polis. I mentioned Governor Bill Ritter was in authority when the governor's awards for high impact research got started with collabs in 2009. Then Governor John Hickenlooper, now Senator, and now Governor Jared Polis have all maintained their 
participation and their sincere enthusiastic support for this network of federal research labs here in Colorado, recognizing both the scientific, public health, environmental, and economic impact that all of the research going on here in Colorado provides. So with this reference to 2019, he wanted to share this kind of perspective and support for all of the year's winners that have happened over the last decade. We haven't had the awards in person because of COVID last year nor this year, but we are looking at a first quarter 2022 plan for some kind of hybrid event. So stay tuned on that, everybody. And with that, I'm going to actually, I'll circle back on who Collabs is towards the end if we have time. But for now, let me stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to turn this over to you, Randy, and to you, Dr. Sievers, and allow you to describe what we're seeing. And uh, I'll sort of step back here and the show is yours. Great, thank you, Dan. And uh, thank you everyone for attending. We hope that you find this session interesting and useful. Is it starting? There we go. I'm Randall Shearer from the University of Colorado Boulder, and I'm privileged to be able to say a few words to reflect on Professor Sievers' work that led to his governor's award on high impact research from 2009. Most recently, I began working with Professor Sievers to help him with his research on hemp chemistry and processing. More than a couple of decades ago, Professor Sievers was my PhD graduate research advisor. In between, I worked for Sievers Instruments, which was founded by Professor Sievers, Dr. Misha Plum, and Dr. Rick Huddy. In a moment, I will briefly describe economic impact of Sievers Instruments to Colorado and the Boulder community. I then will enumerate other areas of research in which Professor Sievers made a high degree of impact through his academic career. But first, I wish to provide you with some impressive statistics. In Professor Sievers' career, spanning almost five decades, he graduated 44 PhD students, advised and mentored numerous masters and undergraduate students, visiting scholars and postdocs. In addition to his full professorship, he served as director of series for 13 years and CU regent for 12 years and dean of the graduate school for two years. He brought in tens of millions of sponsored research dollars to CU and was active in the establishment of Anschutz, Boulder East and South campuses. He won numerous academic awards, has authored or co-authored more than 200 publications, several books, book chapters, and has over 5,000 citations, as well as over 30 issued patents. In addition, he's donated to and graced CU campuses with several marble sculptures carved by his own hand. He founded a number of companies, perhaps the best known being Seavers Instruments, formed in 1984, which has manufactured over 30,000 analyzers within Boulder for installations in laboratories all over the world, including a couple out of this world being used on the International Space Station for measuring water quality. I had the fortune to work for Seavers Instruments as an employee for a time, and I participated in its explosive growth from a small company of a dozen or so employees to almost 200 strong in the span of just a few years. I took part in its acquisition by Ionix, which was later purchased by General Electric, and I oversaw the spin-off of its chemiluminescence detector line that was purchased by Agilent Technologies. The company is still headquartered in Gun Barrel and is now part of Suez, the engineering firm known for designing and constructing the Suez Canal. Looking back and looking around, it becomes clear that the success of any new company is a rare event, and the success of a company like Seavers Instruments requires the confluence of capital, the right people, and the ideas at the right time. It also helps to have a hero or two. Analyzers sold by Seavers Instruments and its successor companies so far account for nearly $2 billion in local revenue to Boulder and Colorado, and much more than this globally. Following the 2009 Governor's Award, Professor Seavers' research team worked on needle-free vaccines for approximately the next decade, 
culminating in the design and execution of a phase one clinical trial for measles vaccination. This work was largely supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the trial was carried out in India. This work demonstrated safety and effectiveness of the technology and vaccine, as well as advantages of this dry powder technology for large scale distribution and temperature stability of the vaccines themselves, which is important, especially where access to reliable refrigeration is limited. This technology also has obvious advantages for optimum placement of vaccines for respiratory diseases. Like many scientific advances, there is a ripple effect whose impacts are far reaching from the original splash. The technology was transferred to the Serum Institute of India and has also been applied to other areas, such as production of dry powdered cannabinoids. And Professor Sievers has published on measles vaccines with colleagues at John Hopkins University Medical School just last year. Professor Sievers' research interests cover a broad array of subjects from aerosols to zirconia. Beyond his academic research, he's most proud of the education of his students and their ultimate successes both at CU and elsewhere. I've been fortunate to have the opportunity to work for Professor Sievers again. My appreciation for his creativity, scientific contributions has grown. I've come to more clearly recognize his pioneering spirit, thirst for knowledge, discovery, and a tendency to ask why not as often as asking why. It was a great honor for Professor Sievers to have won the 2009 Governor's Award, sponsored by CoLabs. Professor Sievers has recently directed his research interests toward hep cultivation and processing to provide ultra-pure cannabinoids for other researchers. A short video follows of Professor Sievers in his hemp field describing his enthusiasm for hemp and why its time has come. It is timely to announce that Professor Sievers will retire from CU at the end of the month. He thought it appropriate to invite two esteemed colleagues to speak. These are John Burks and Maggie Tolbert, each of whom Professor Sievers had helped to recruit to CU. John will speak on where flying, flying kites led him, and Maggie will address her research on examining atmospheric organics, one particle at a time. Great. Thanks, Randy. It's all working. Oh, it's... Uh, hold on a second. <laughs> Let me back up. I think I need to do this differently. I'll take a moment while you're doing that. Okay, I'm, I'm figuring it out. <laughs> and thanks uh, everyone in the audience. If you want to use the chat function for any questions, I'll be moderating those towards the end after a couple more of the presentations and speakers here. So please submit any comments, questions, and we'll be happy to provide those directly to Dr. Sievers and his team. Dan, uh, is there any chance you have the uh, video from Sonia that you could play. I do have that. Hold on, I will bring that up myself if it's not something working on your on your end. Let's see. And thanks everybody for uh, your patience. I can't uh, get it to work. Carter. Okay. I'm bringing this up and let me see that. Uh... Oh. I wonder if you heard that. Dan, can you hear me? 
Yes. Uh, I can't seem to get the video to share, so. Okay, I'll do um, it on mine. I should be. Pardon me, everybody. We will get this going here. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing your screen, Randy. Okay. So I can share mine. And we'll make sure we can do this. Okay. Does that come up there? Yeah, great, thank you. Okay, here we go. Oh, and if- Savers, and I'm a hemp farmer, and I'm also a hemp scientist. Pardon me, everyone. Don't mean to pause. Uh, Randy and Bob and myself will put ourselves on mute so we don't inadvertently interrupt the uh, audio of the video coming here. In the early 2000s, I became a principal investigator. All right. Hello, everyone. I apologize. I'd gotten some messages that we can't, uh, you couldn't hear the sound here. Apparently, that's if I put myself on mute. And for Bob and Randy, you'll have to look. I think you have a request to be unmuted and you have to answer that. Not that you have to speak right now. Alas, I apologize to the audience there with our technical difficulties. If you could give me, when I start the video here, Randy, if you give me a thumbs up or down, if you're hearing the sound, uh, that would be helpful. And I'll try this again. Okay. Uh, the Zoom screen sharing experience. Okay, I think you see that. Now let's see if we get sound when I play it here. I'm Bob Severs, and I'm a hemp farmer, and I'm also a hemp scientist. In the early 2000s, I became a principal investigator for the Gates Foundation by winning a competitive $20 million grant to develop needle-free vaccines for use in four countries. Some of those same technology developments are being used in the development of hemp products. This is the sixth year that we have been growing hemp in this plot. It's a wonderful plot on a gradual slope. In um, the far eastern corner of Boulder County in the state of Colorado. This is a uh, field which is all hemp. It's been analyzed. We know it's hemp because we've taken the samples into the laboratory. We look especially in the blossom of the hemp plants because that's where the cannabidiol CBD concentrations are the highest. And these are the materials, not THC, that we're most interested in. The difference between hemp and marijuana is only the amount of THC, the one that is psychoactive. It's higher 
in marijuana than it is in hemp. Not very much. So more than 0.3% THC makes it marijuana. Less than 0.3% a dry weight of THC makes it hemp. The plants come in many, many different varieties. There are hundreds of varieties. And you can see behind me and around me these almost like Christmas trees. Some of them are more than seven feet tall, and they've been known to grow as high as 14 feet. CBD oil has uh, shown uh, characteristics that have to do with reduction of inflammation. Of, of people suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome. The crop was uh, as good as we could have expected. Hemp is a material whose time has come. Sorry, we have some bad echo there. Dr. Severs, if I could interrupt for a second, Randy, we might have to trade uh, the microphone or or otherwise if you turn off your mic and let him have his on. We we're missing his comments there. Yeah. That's okay. Well, uh, again, good morning and thank you for the invitation and for the award very indebted to all the people that have contributed to this work. And uh, you saw everyone from, from uh, PhDs to uh, my grandson, uh, Benjamin, uh, who's uh, living now in uh, La Jolla and is working on uh, vaccines uh, as uh, part of his um, uh, baccalaureate uh, degree. So um, I'll, um, I'll fall silent and let uh, you uh, uh, ask questions for a few minutes. All right. You, and so Randy, if you tell me, yes, was there a, a next set of slides you wanted to show or would we take some, some questions? Now? I have a couple that I would prompt Dr. Severs with. Please allow me to share my screen. Okay. Yep, you should be able to do that. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this symposium honoring Bob Sievers. Today I would like to tell you a little about our ongoing research into ways to empower communities to evaluate air pollution in their neighborhoods 
using portable air pollution monitors. I will begin with some background about our work on vertical profiling of air pollutants using kites, balloons, and aircraft that led us to miniaturizing air pollution monitors. But first, I would like to say a few words about my colleague and good friend, Bob Sievers. I worked alongside Bob for 25 years at the University of Colorado. Bob is a person who recruited me to move my research Oh, Randy, we lost the audio there. Uh, Randy, we, we lost the audio. Doing John's talk <laughs> and then Maggie's talk. And then we'll, um, I'm going to make a couple comments and then we'll open it up for questions. Randy, we, we lost the audio there. Hmm. Uh, Randy, we lost the audio there. Okay. Or perhaps it paused. But first, I would like to say a okay. few words about my colleague and good friend, Bob Sievers. I worked alongside Bob for 25 years at the University of Colorado. Bob is a person who recruited me to move my research group from the University of Illinois the CU back in 1977. And he served as an important mentor to me during my entire faculty career, not only as a senior faculty member in the Department of Chemistry, but also for many years as the director of my institute, the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences, or CERES. At the time I met Bob, he was already a distinguished scientist. At Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, where he started his career, he had already invented NMR shift reagents, for which he had received numerous patents, achieved the first separation of optical isomers in chromatography by using a chiral stationary vase, and led a team that analyzed the first moon rocks that, that were brought to Earth. On this slide, I mentioned these and a few other areas that immediately come to mind where Bob has made many important contributions. These include new detectors, for gas chromatography and supercritical fluid chromatography, the organic products formed during the ozonation of drinking water, development of new methods to measure chemical species in the atmosphere, especially the oxides of nitrogen, development of the supercritical fluid extraction technique for gas chromatography, production of ultrafine particles for drug delivery, such as vaccines, and isolation, identification, and purification of cannabinoids. I ended this list when I ran out of space, but he has made many other important contributions as well. I can say with complete confidence that Bob is one of the most creative scientists I've ever known, so I'm very pleased to be able to contribute to this symposium in his honor. Beginning in the 1990s, our group, in collaboration with another CU scientist, Ben Balsley, began to develop methods to make vertical measurements through the atmospheric boundary layer. Through vertical profiling studies, we were able to learn how air pollutants like ozone can be transported over long distances, often hundreds to thousands of miles. By measuring concentration profiles through the atmospheric boundary layer, we were also able to measure landscape scale fluxes of gases such as carbon dioxide measure, for example, the net flux of CO2 to a forest as, as it is being taken up by photosynthesis. In order to obtain vertical profiles, we began using high-tech parafoil kites, such as the one shown here. An aerospace graduate student, Mike Jensen, developed an inverted wing, shown in the lower left-hand corner, that could fly up and down the kite tether carrying an instrument package. The kite served as a skyhook, and the remotely controlled tethered lifting system, or TLS, could carry an instrument package up and down the tether. The TLS was an upside down wing, so that it developed negative lift when parallel to the wind. When orient oriented at 45 degrees to the wind, it would travel up the tether due to drag, and when oriented parallel to the wind, it would fly down. By attaching an instrument package to this device, 
we can obtain vertical profiles of both chemical species and meteorological parameters. Often the wind was not strong enough though, so we would use tethered balloons, shown in the upper right corner. In this case, we winched the balloon up and down. We found that often there was not enough wind for a kite and too much wind for a balloon. So finally, I obtained my pilot's license and bought a Cessna 182 that allowed us to do vertical profiling under all wind conditions. The main problem we had in all of this work though, even with the Cessna, was the instruments were too large, heavy, and required too much power to be used on these platforms. For our vertical profiling work, we needed small, lightweight, low power instruments. Even my Cessna couldn't provide enough power to operate the Thermo 49i ozone monitor shown here for very long. And at 55 pounds, of course, it couldn't be lifted by a kite or a balloon. So in the series electronic shop, we developed what was later commercialized as the Model 202 ozone monitor, an instrument spun off to 2 b technologies and still being sold today. This ozone monitor, which like the thermo, is an EPA federal equivalent method, meaning that it can be used to monitor for compliance with the Clean Air Act. Notice from the table that it weighs 10 times less and consumes more than 20 times less power. A few years later at Tubi Tech, we developed the personal ozone monitor or POM, which weighs only one pound and draws only three watts of power. The POM has been designated as an EPA federal equivalent method as well. The need for miniaturized instruments led me to co-found 2B Technologies with Mark Bollinger, a former PhD student of Bob Seavers, in 1998. The 2B and 2B Technologies refers to the two founders, Bollinger and Burks. In 2000, I left the university and joined 2B Technologies and I took over leadership of 2B Tech in 2005. As shown on this timeline, over the past nearly 20 years, 2B Technologies has developed more than 20 uniquely different products that include portable air pollution monitors and portable calibrators. Our most recent product, shown at the end of this timeline, is the AQ Sync fixed base monitoring station that includes several of our FEM grade miniaturized instruments. I'll have more to say about the AQSync soon. 2B Technologies currently manufactures, markets, and sells about 1,000 instruments per year, and we have sold more than 9,000 instruments to date. Using Google Scholar, we track all of the publications that cite use of our instruments in scientific research. To date, more than 1,300 published papers, abstracts, student theses, etc cite the use of 2B Tech instruments in their work. We have designed our instruments to be not only portable, but also capable of operating in extreme environments. This has allowed their use in a wide range of applications for the first time. Those applications include our original intent of vertical profiling, but also applications such as the Oboy experiment shown here, where ozone buoys were released in the Arctic Ocean. A few hundred of our instruments have been deployed by the National Park Service and the National Forest Service and com comparable agencies throughout the world. And our ozone monitors have been used in a wide range of research aircraft and remotely piloted vehicles, such as the recently retired NASA Global Hawk shown here. In 2009, we became interested in how our instruments could be used in K-12 education, and we founded the Global Ozone Project, or GO3 Project, where we placed ozone monitors at more than 100 schools, about 30 of which were in foreign countries. Ozone data were uploaded to the web every 15 minutes from these stations for seven or eight years. Students plotted their data online and compared the results with those of other schools on a social network similar to Facebook that was devoted solely to the GO3 project. This project was in place for about seven years and generated more than 12 million ozone measurements around the world. As sensor technologies became available and popular, we decided to go mobile and launch the Air Quality Trex or AQ Trex project shown here. For this, we developed the Personal Air Monitor or PAM that measures CO, 
CO2, and particulate matter, PM1, PM2.5, and PM10. In AQTREX, students form hypotheses about where they might find high and low levels of air pollution and carry the PAM along a trek of their own design. Data are broadcast to the students' mobile phones where results are displayed in real time and are uploaded to the web for graphical display and analysis. Here are some students from North Glen High School on a trek. The boy in the orange sweatshirt is carrying the PAM, while other students are looking at results on their mobile phones in real time. To the left is a mobile trek as displayed on the cell phone app. PM 2.5 is shown at, the, at one selected point here with a value of 191 micrograms per cubic meter, very high value. This trek was obtained in Golden, Colorado on a day heavily impacted by forest fire smoke. We have implemented AQ treks in classes at more than 150 schools throughout the country with participation by about 9,000 students. The big emphasis in our company now is mobile monitoring. The idea is to use vehicles of opportunity, such as buses, trash trucks, delivery trucks, and rideshare cars, in other words, Uber and Lyft, to continuously map air pollution throughout cities. For this, we have developed a car topper enclosure for the, for the same PAM used in the AQTREX student project. So the car topper is shown in the lower left corner there. The car topper attaches to the top of vehicles with magnetic feet, and the PAM's internal battery is continuously recharged by the vehicle's 5 volt USB or 12 volt cigarette lighter adapter. We're now expanding the PAM to include sensors for NO2 and SO2 as well. One of the biggest problems with low cost sensors, though, is sensitivity and baseline drift with changes in temperature and humidity. One of our approaches to solving this problem is the use of a few AQC reference stations distributed throughout the city. The idea is to be able to maintain reasonably accurate sensor calibrations by either occasionally driving by or preferably parking by a reference station for a few minutes. We've recently begun a mobile monitoring experiment in the city of Denver, where we have mounted car toppers on five municipal trash trucks and have been obtaining data for about a month now. We have three AQ sync stations that they drive by in order to compare results and calibrate the low cost mobile sensors in real time. One is located at the parking area where they spend the night. Another is located at the site where they dump their trash. And a third is located with a state operated compliance monitoring station. Shown here is one example of a single trash truck route. Air pollutant measurements are continu continuously made and data are uploaded via cellular connection every two seconds. The map on the left shows the entire route and the small neighborhood is shown in expanded view in the middle of the slide. On the right is a color scale for the color coded measurement points on the map. As you can see, there appears to be some source of particulate matter in this neighborhood. In this case, we can rule out sampling of the truck exhaust due to the lack of increased concentrations of CO and CO2 in the same data stream. The ability to obtain hyperlocal data, such as that shown here, will allow us to find the major sources of air pollution in Denver. This example may turn out to be something as simple as a backyard barbecue taking place, but if repeated, it will be a site that requires further investigation to determine the source. We very recently obtained a research grant from NIH to develop and implement a program for community monitoring of air quality that we have branded AQ Earth, where the AQ stands for air quality as it does in AQ tracks and AQ sync discussed earlier. In most cases, AQ Earth will be centered around schools, an important hub of communities. The goal is to develop a replicable program that can be used in cities throughout the US and much of the world that will allow communities to discover the sources of air pollution in their own neighborhoods, similar to what we are doing with trash trucks in Denver. Both fixed-based mobile air quality data will be generated and uploaded to the web where it will be available to community members and local decision makers to work to reduce air pollution at the local level. The project expands on a program called Love My Air, developed by Michael Ogletree in Denver, 
and makes use of our IQ Trex program and mobile mapping that will be carried out by parents and other volunteers in cooperation with local air quality scientists. These are our partners in AQ Earth. They include Michael Ogletree of the Denver Department of Public Health and Environment, Tim Dye of TD Associates, Matt Beach of Sensible IoT, and Albert Presto of Carnegie Mellon University. On the right are the three U.S. cities, one international city, and tribal area that we'll be working closely with for implementation of AQ Earth over the next three years. These cities and tribal area were chosen in large part because of our contacts with air quality specialists in those communities that are anxious to work with us. The city of Fort Collins will allow us to implement AQ Earth at a nearby location, as we will probably need to travel there frequently as we, as we develop the program. Anchorage, Alaska will provide an opportunity to test our PAM and AQ Sync under extreme cold conditions, while the deployment in the Dry Counties chapter of the Navajo Nation in New Mexico will allow us to evaluate our system in a very hot environment. The Navajo Nation also will provide us with an opportunity to work in an environmental justice community where fracking for oil and gas is prevalent on both private and tribal lands. In Atlanta, Georgia, we will be working in cooperation with environmental justice advocates in a predominantly black neighborhood. Finally, Mexico City will allow us to test and further develop the AQ Earth program to apply to international cities. This concludes my talk. I want to congratulate Professor Robert Sievers for winning this prestigious award and thank him for all he has done in his lifetime to make the world a better place through his creative advances in science and technology. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Randy and Dr. Sievers. That presentation by John was uh, fascinating and it's raised a few different questions. I wonder if either Dr. Sievers or you, Randy, can speak to some of that technology that John described. Uh, uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot with what might be more of his expertise as opposed to your own. Uh, but one thing that came to mind immediately regarding the AQ Earth effort and the vehicle toppers. Hi, Dan, the same thing happened. Um, I can't seem to con transition from PowerPoint to um, video. To video. If I can help with that, I can bring up what would be that next video. Yeah, it says Final Tolbert is the video. Okay. Let me double check on this here. Nice. Uh, and thank you everybody for your patience with this there. All right, Final Tolbert, here we go. And I'll make sure I leave my audio on. <laughs> That all works for everybody. Just a moment. Okay, let me share screen here from, from Margaret. Okay. Oh, and please give me a thumbs up again that you, you can hear it when it starts. Hello. I'm delighted to be here today to present some of our recent research at the CoLab session celebrating Bob Severs' 2009 Governor's Award. Bob has had a remarkable career studying aerosols, including the use of aerosols for vaccine delivery. Today, I'll be talking about some of our work looking at fundamental properties of aerosols with an eye towards their impact on the atmosphere. In these images, you can see some light scattering patterns of different particle morphologies that we can detect in the laboratory. For example, a liquid particle is shown in the upper right, and these linear fringes are seen in the scattering pattern, whereas a solid, solid particle has this much more chaotic scattering pattern. And we see everything in between, as shown in these bottom two graphs. The focus of my talk will be looking at how organic molecules 
change the particle properties. But the idea of organics and particles goes back a long way. Here's an example of some data on organic particles that was actually collected from Bob's research group in 1996. What they did was they collected particles from a forest fire in Boulder Canyon, and then they did ion chromatography to figure out what the composition of those particles were. And what you can see here are all these different peaks, and each one of these peaks is a different organic molecule. And so you can see there are a lot of different organic molecules in these particles. It's a very complex particle composition. Now, this early work from Bob's group was really way ahead of its time. What I did here was go to Web of Science and look up papers with the word atmosphere, organic, and aerosol in the title versus year. And what you can see here is Bob's work in 1996 was really just at the beginning of an explosion in this field looking at atmospheric organic particles. So this is really a characteristic of Bob's career. He has been a leader in many new areas, including in the aerosol vaccine delivery. Today, I'd like to talk with you about our work looking at clouds and aerosols. And our focus is going to be to look at just one particle at a time. So if you look at these two clouds, we can see that they look different. On the left, the cloud is dark, but this is actually a clean cloud. And we can see that when we look at the particles, there's a relatively small number of large particles. And this cloud lets most sunlight right through. In contrast, the cloud on the right is affected by air pollution. And as a result, there's a large number of much smaller particles. The cloud is much whiter and reflects sunlight much stronger. And so what you can see is these different types of clouds would have different impacts on climate. And the details of the particles that nucleated those clouds are what lead to these differences in cloud properties. So to gain insight into cloud formation, we're going to be looking at methods to examine these single particles and how they affect clouds. One method that we use to study single particles in our laboratory and series is the Raman microscope, and this is set up in my lab. And here, what we do is we collect particles on a plate, and that's sort of similar to Bob's experiment of collecting particles from the forest fire. But we, here we put them on a plate, and then we probe them one particle at a time to get the chemical composition. And we do that with Raman spectroscopy using this laser. And so what we do is we raster the laser across the particle to get the composition at each little location that's shown in red on this graph. And then we combine all that information to get the particle composition map. And an example of that is shown here. And this was a study from Storm Peak here in Colorado. It was led by my graduate student, Kelly Bastian. And um, this is the study was done in the winter. You can see there's a lot of snow there. Here is the particle collection system outside. And you can see Kelly with her skis. Um, they didn't want to use the restroom in this facility because they didn't want to impact any of the particle properties. So they had to ski down to the lodge to use the restroom and hit a ride back up with a snowcat uh, when they were wanting to come back to lab. Anyway, here is an example of a structure of a particle she collected. And what we found is that very complex particles were observed, much like Bob saw. Almost all the particles that we detected contained organics. And about 14% of the particles had this really interesting structure where the organics were in a coating on the outside of the particle. And so you have this sort of core shell morphology where the core is this sulfate particle surrounded by an organic. Hmm. And that really made us wonder what the impact of that organic coating might be on cloud formation. And so to study that, we looked at two different mixing states for organic particles in the lab where we specifically generated these different morphologies to see how they would impact cloud formation. 
On the left, we generated a particle that had an ammonium sulfate core and an organic coating. Both of these are liquid, a liquid ammonium sulfate core, um, so it's a solution, and a liquid organic coating. On the right, we used a different organic, in this case a sugar, which is highly viscous, and when mixed with ammonium sulfate, it makes an amorphous solid or even sort of a glass. You can think of this almost like a marble, but a squishy marble. Now, I want to point out that ammonium sulfate itself is an excellent ice nucleus. And so what we're asking is how the organics might impact this ice nucleation. Would they impede ice formation? Or if ice formation still occurred, would the ice structure change? And so what we're going to do is first look at this example on the left. So we have an ammonium sulfate core and a shell of organic. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this particle, it's on a plate, and we're going to lower the temperature and in the presence of water and see if ice forms. And I'm going to give you a hint, it's going to form, it's going to form right where this little star is. So look right here on the particle and we're going to see this forming as we cool our particle. So here we go, the particle's cooling and there the ice formed and it's just kind of oozing its way out through the liquid particle and growing and making this really odd looking ice crystal. And mm -hmm. so what we see here is water vapor was able to diffuse right through that, that organic coating as if it wasn't even there and nucleate ice right on the ammonium sulfate where it wants to nucleate ice. And then the ice just grew and the liquid just started coating the ice and you end up with this morphology. Okay, so water was able to diffuse. It's like that organic layer actually wasn't even there. Nothing happened. It was the same as if it was pure ammonium sulfate almost. Okay, well, what about the other morphology? Now we have our viscous organic in this sort of soft marble form. What happens when we lower the temperature in the presence of water now? Well, here what we see is something different. Now we see the ice forming right on the outside. Water can't diffuse through this. It's hard like a marble. And so we get a different kind of nucleation and a different structure of the ice particle. Look at that ice particle. It looks like a cube. So something very, very different in the two cases. Hmm. So to summarize, what we saw is that both particle morphologies with the organics were good ice nuclei. It didn't matter if there was a coating or if it was a glass. Either of these cases caused ice nucleation to happen readily, but the final ice structure was different with um, different ice morphologies at the end of the nucleation process. And this ice then could interact with solar radiation differently, and it could have a different impact on climate. So when you look at these single particle things, you can start to appreciate some of the complexity in ice nucleation. Now, the next thing we wanted to study was a different kind of ice nucleation. And this is something we call contact nucleation. And the idea here is if you have two liquid particles and they collide and touch each other, could that nucleate ice? Or if you had a solid and a liquid, could the touching itself nucleate ice? Now, that's a really hard um, question to answer. So we started with a similar question, which is, can a liquid particle crystallize when you touch it? And so that's what I'm going to share now. Now, to study um, contact nucleation in the laboratory is quite difficult. And there have been almost no studies of this because to probe contact nucleation, you have to keep the surface just like it would be in the atmosphere. Hmm. So you can't deposit it on a plate because that would change the surface. So you need to do this on freely floating particles. But if the particles are freely floating, how do you detect them? So we've developed an optical levitation technique to do just that. We use lasers from above and below to trap a single droplet in the air. And then we bring in seed particles to touch that droplet and see what happens. Now, to determine whether we have created crystallization, we use optical imaging. And here on the right are two examples of optical imaging. 
If the particle is liquid, we'll see these, in, these linear fringes, whereas if it's crystalline, we'll see this more chaotic pattern. So if any of you are ever wandering at the halls of Ceres, you are welcome to drop by and visit the lab in person. And here you can just see what the setup looks like. We have lasers coming in from above and below to, drop, to trap the particle. And this particular particle is in the trap right there. It's that green bright spot in the middle. And so we trap our droplet and then we're gonna bring in crystals to touch it. Well, this trap is particularly stable. Most optical traps can trap liquids, but very few can trap solids. And this is an example of what just plain old table salt looks like in our trap as a liquid and a solid. So on the right, we have a liquid droplet of salt with water, and you can see it's pretty stable in the trap and the slight like, scattering pattern of these lines, these linear fringes. In contrast, when you crystallize it and have a crystal of salt, salt is cubic. And this is actually remarkable. Our particle looks like a cube. It's amazing. So the microscopic structure is mirrored in the macroscopic structure. So anyhow, we're, the trap is not nearly as stable for these solid particles, but we are able to trap these solids basically indefinitely. So we will know if a particle crystallizes. We're going to use these same two morphologies that we've been talking about to see how crystallization is impacted by the organic with these same two morphologies. So we have the organic coated particle, and we're going to bring in a crystal of ammonium sulfate, and we have the organic glass, and we're going to bring in a crystal of ammonium sulfate. Now it's important to note here that a crystal of ammonium sulfate would be a perfect match to seed crystallization. So this is sort of like cloud seeding. You use a crystal to seed clouds that has a good lattice match for ice. But here, it's not just a good lattice match, it's a perfect match because the crystal is the same component as the liquid. So the question is, will this organic coating act as a barrier for crystallization? Because we're not touching the ammonium sulfate, we're touching the, li the organic liquid. And over here, with this on the right, will the viscous organic prevent crystallization? Okay, so if we look at that, first let's look at the one with the liquid organic coating. We're going to bring in our ammonium sulfate and touch the organic coating. Now this goes pretty fast, so you have to look quickly. What you can see is at the start, we have these linear fringes. We have a liquid droplet, and our particle looks round. Now, in this case, I'm not showing you the contact. You're going to have to trust me, but we can see it just after about a second. We have contact. Whoop, there it is. And then we have a crystalline particle. Now, you can see it's a crystalline particle. It just looks like a crystalline particle. It used to be spherical, and now it's a crystal. You also see when it crystallizes, it flies out of the trap. Why is that? Well, it lost all of its water when it crystallized, so it was lighter, so it went up. So then we had to increase the light intensity, light intensity from the laser above and push it back down. And so what we see is this organic coating. Again, it had like no impact. Even hmm. though the ammonium sulfate hit the organic coating, it still caused the ammonium sulfate inside to nucleate and crystallize, which is kind of amazing. Hmm. Now, if we do this with the viscous organic glass, we see something different. In this case, we used raffinose, which is like sugar mixed with ammonium sulfate, and it made a real, like a soft marble. And what we see now is when we bring in the solid ammonium sulfate, um, we're bringing it in and it has contact in this second frame, and nothing much happens. That ammonium sulfate just sticks on the particle as the particle is rotating in the trap. It does not cause crystallization. So here, the viscous glass prevented the diffusion of the water in or out, and crystallization was impeded. And so here we have two different results. The liquid organic coating did not act as a barrier, and the ammonium sulfate went right through, whereas the viscous organic prevented crystallization. So this particle phase seems to deter is determined by the type of organic you have. I'd also like to point out the particle phase is important in generating stable and effective vaccines, and that's one of the things that Bob worked on. 
So sometimes we really need to understand these particle fundamentals in order to make practical advances in things we care about, like the environment and human health. So in closing, I'd like to reflect on my journey at CU in series. I was hired by series in 1991, and Bob was the director then, where I began my career looking at stratospheric chemistry surrounding the Antarctic ozone hole. And although throughout my whole time here, I've always continued my studies of clouds and aerosols, the relevant topics have changed from stratospheric chemistry to troposphere. And more recently, I've been studying clouds on Mars and Titan. And most recently, I'm starting to study on Venus clouds. So I would like to thank Bob for first hiring me. Um, I'm just delighted to have spent 30 years at Ceres. Also his inspiration in never being afraid to try something new. And that is really a hallmark of Bob's career. For his leadership in series as the director and in other roles on campus, and for his support of my research program over the last 30 years. And finally, I'd like to thank my students at CU working in my research group. It has been the honor of a lifetime to work at series with all these fantastic students and help them along in their journeys. Thank you so much for your attention. Congratulations, Bob. All right, Thank you wonderful. so much, Maggie. <laughs> That's fantastic. And um, <clears throat> I see all these faces and I'm reminded of uh, the work that they did during the weekends and often in, in, in uh, field sites. And uh, I'm just amazed that uh, all this has worked as well as it has. And uh, the whole uh, groups uh, have uh, collaborated in many, many ways. And um, so I'm, I'm just overwhelmed. I, I see that this is the day that uh, the Japanese um, Pearl Harbor, a, a sad day in many. Um, I'm um, 86 years old now. And I remember uh, on the this very day that my grandmother came in to the field uh, where we were uh, harvesting the crop uh, and um, and said uh, that she was so hoping that uh, that this would be the war that ended all wars. It doesn't seem to be working that way, but I think that um, we um, have found ways to learn in spite of, of all uh, the Im impediments there have been. And so um, um, for those of you who, um, uh, worship in a particular church. Uh, this is a day to um, to note the the ways that we have managed to cope. Um, I uh, will now turn to Dan to see if there are questions uh, and uh, how he wants to proceed. Sure. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Sievers, and. and uh, thank you, Randy, as well. Uh, I want to honor everyone's uh, time that we had scheduled for this, and we're a couple minutes over. However, I don't want to uh, jump off too quickly, and I uh, want to start with really a, a sincere grand thank you, and the wonderful, uh, almost, uh, I shouldn't say astonishment, because I was aware of some of your research and how others have been leveraging and building on your research, but the, the uh, I don't know, the, the sincere kind of appreciation and the awe, I think that's it, to see the ways in which your chemistry background, your chemistry expertise has manifested out in these different ways across different spectrums. In taking notes here, listening to John and Maggie speak and and uh, the comments that had come in on the side, I'm really intrigued to follow up with even more of a, a set of either articles or short interviews that could help people understand how your research is helping to 
address particularly some of these environmental challenges that we have with technologies that I'll speak as myself as a 1994 CU Boulder environmental conservation grad, uh, the themes that we were discussing then have now been advanced so much further in terms of the ability to measure and to research and to discern what is going on. It's wonderful. And you're really one of the foundational scientists here at University of Colorado who have helped build this kind of awareness amongst the scientific community. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you. So, um, Randy, would you have any other thoughts there? And as I glance down, part of when you see me looking down, I'm checking the chat and other messages that might be coming in to me here that I'll share with you. Okay. Um, I, I want to thank you, Dan, and thank you for all the participants today. Uh, I think Professor Sievers would be happy to take a question if there are any. Oh, so I'm going to hand over <laughs> my mic to Professor Sievers. And uh, yes, thanks you know, again, Dan. You're welcome. And uh, let me, I'll, I'll mention a uh, comment here that's come, once you have your headphones on so you can hear a comment that had come in from Stephen Cape uh, saying, Bob, congratulations on your many well-deserved awards over the years, including the governor's awards uh, going back to 2009. And Stephen says, I'm honored to have had the opportunity to have worked in your lab and spin out company, Active Dry, for many years. And thank you for your mentorship and leadership during that time and the many opportunities provided by you. So that's from Steve. Well, Steve, this uh, is a, a especially um, auspicious moment because um, Steve was the winner of the Kalpana Chawla uh, Award in, um, um, in, in recognition of his pioneering work that uh, was conducted within the first 10 years of his, of his graduation uh, and, his, uh, and his management of um, the group that we uh, shared. So um, uh, I, I don't know um, how, how best to um, say anything more about that, except to say that um, this, uh, we, we have had many people in our group and um, Steve happens to have spent uh, time in uh, Brazil. And um, we have um, th through the years um, uh, benefited greatly for um, his um, pioneering work. So um, again, uh, thank you, Steve. And I'll turn to the next question if there are any more. And if not, why well, I'll turn it back to Dan. All right, you know, uh, so I, I don't have another question here, uh, but I would end then with a, another thank you for your, for your time this morning and the video, this whole meeting video, as well as the segments of videos that were provided by John, by Maggie and by Sonia, these will all be available for our full network to watch uh, at their convenience. And we'll be sending out more notes to uh, all of our circle of scientists and technologists, inviting them to watch this. And I should mention, Sonia, I know you had stepped back off of screen, but if you were there, I'd like to say thank you. And perhaps uh, I'm sure uh, Dr. Sievers and Randy would all say that video you had uh, out in the field uh, was magnificent and <laughs> prompts so many questions. Actually, I should, uh, since we're over time, when I watched it, that's the third time I've watched it now was this morning. And uh, boy, the, the the sort of wheels get turning in your head as to what about that? What was that thing he was holding there? Well, you, you were very intriguing in the way that you filmed this. And uh, of course, your work there, Dr. Sievers, really uh, begs a lot of additional questions. So that's why I think there can be some follow up after this. Uh, and thanks. There's a a quick reverence just came in. Bravo uh, to Randy and Sonia. <laughs> um, and that's coming from a person you may know. Um, that is coming from Christy Spencer. Oh, my God. So, yes. she, she is my, um, 
my favorite uh, offspring. Um, oh. <laughs> of course, I only have um, uh, her and uh, my son in the first generation, and now I'm, uh, we're working on the fourth generation. So uh, wonderful. We uh -huh. um, and we should thank uh, the Daily Camera for the uh, picture of Dan. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, my <laughs> my uh, grandson. Uh, who they had uh, in their archive uh, pictures of um, acting in um, in, in a way uh, that was uh, was a copy of a, of a um, uh, of a a uh, administration of uh, of um, particles uh, for um, for treatment of uh, pain. And so um, mm -hmm. we should uh, not uh, fail to thank them. And, and I think he's probably uh, on the line someplace or will be someday. Uh, and uh, we're still working on ways to, um, uh, to avoid um, the uh, adverse effects of um, the particles that are in the air now, uh, both uh, viruses and um, bacteria and uh, inert materials as well. So uh, I'll stop and uh, again, uh, pray for a, a uh, peace in the world and pray for all the people who need our assistance and our, our tutoring and our everything else. And I've learned this much from my students and my mentor John Christian Baylor Jr., who was a student here um, in 1923, uh, a whole century, and uh, has uh, has mentored himself uh, about 90 PhDs at the University of Illinois. Amazing. So, good day. Right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, and uh, I definitely appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone in the audience, for your attention and your thoughts. And this will be one of several. We'll be doing a series here, visiting with the Governor's Awards for High Impact Research winners over the next several weeks into 2022. This will actually be happening in January and February. So we look forward to seeing you on another session. And uh, that's all. Thanks for joining us today. Appreciate your time, everyone. Great.